First, someone that we've known and loved for a very long time. Please welcome John Delancey. Good morning, John. Good morning. Um, please welcome the, the instigating factor from a dramaturgy point of view, Issa Briones. Good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. That's a fun necklace. What's going on over there? Oh, which one? Well, the... <laughs> My lanyard? No, 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 the one that looks like you could have some kind of Star Trekian scroll in there. Like. Well, I do love that that is where your mind went. It is actually, um, you know, because I'm a little crunchy, um, <laughs> it is a crystal situation. So, just trying to keep myself balanced am amidst this uh, rocky ocean, you know? <laughs> All right, well, you know, on Star Trek, we do nothing with crystals or orbs or anything oh, nothing, like that. No, nothing, never, no. never. Um, we have another guest with us all the way from Melbourne, Australia, and coming soon to New York. Please welcome Evan Evagoria. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Evan, uh, who was with us when uh, Evan joined us for trivia on night one, which feels like a year and a half ago? A couple of people. Evan, were you impressed by how well the Star Trek audience to put it bluntly, knew their shit. Yes, but I was also impressed by how well all of these Trekkies drink. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of partying and good time, who, who was at Q's costume ball last night? Show your hands, raise your hands. Yeah. It's been a Q thing since year one, right? It's been, that's been your beat since the, since the first year on this cruise, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, I mean, just, you know, you come back every year and you see the creativity and the uh, ability to get that stuff into a, a suitcase and onto the ship. What's it like for you to... to... Steamer trunk. I think they come with steamer trunks. <laughs> it's got to be fun when you see people dressed as Q, because that does happen regularly. The, uh, uh, yes, as a matter of fact, there was a gentleman last night that I went, oh my god, there I am. <laughs> Um, uh, no, it's great. God, they phone, stop it. They spam call. How? How are they reaching you? I don't know. They never stop. They never stop. Yeah, they want to make sure that the warranty on my car is... <laughs> um, uh, um, I love the costume. Because in fact, it is a lot of creativity, and it's really fun to watch. So, and, and everybody else gets a, a, a you know enjoyable time out of it. Uh, I have been asked over the years, especially during Halloween, do you get dressed up in, in, in a costume? I go, I only get dressed up in costumes when I'm paid. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm delighted everybody else enjoys getting dressed up in costumes. Um, well, so that actually speaks to another point, because, John, you've been on the cruise all this time. Two years ago was the last time we all met, and we were here, and we did panels and whatnot. And never did I dream at that time that you would be back as Q on Star Trek Picard, which I think we're all kind of excited about. But what I want to know, John, is when we were here two years ago, did you know then? Did you already know that you were coming back to Picard two years ago? I'm omnipotent, so of course I know. <laughs> it's just so hard for me not to tell everybody what's going to happen next, right? No, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. Because if you did and you managed to keep it from 3,000 fans, that's, that's pretty cool. So. Yes. Yes, would have been tough. It would have been tough. Um, so, uh, next question, and as, as usual, when we get to about the midway pointer, so I will kick it over to you in the audience. So if you want to start thinking up some questions about uh, 
about anything, really, to ask these three people if we have mic runners on either side. But before uh, we do, a um, question for Issa and Evan, because it's still pretty new at uh, Picard, and there haven't been a lot of live events with the fans since then. So, you know, we haven't actually seen you off of TV yet. Um, you know, it's sort of a basic question, but, but you know, we like to know um, about the casting process and how was it a, a, a simple meeting or was it stretched out over six arduous months? Um, curious to know about when you knew what you were reading for and how that went and if there are some fun stories behind there. And Evan's going to go first. Mine was pretty interesting. They found me at like the final hour, I think, I, a month before shooting. So I was shooting this really, really, really bad horror film in Fiji. Um, and I came back home and I got a bunch of auditions, did a terrible job on all of them. And then this thing called, I think it was Writing Desk? That's the code name? Drawing Room. Drawing Room as the code name. And the only thing that I was told was Sir Patrick Stewart is attached to play the lead. I get given this script for this character called O'Toole and another character called K-Bar, and I was playing K-Bar. So I went into this really dark uh, audition room in Sydney in a really bad area of town too, so I was pretty worried. <laughs> went in there, said my lines, left thinking I did a terrible job, and then I fly back to Fiji and I get a call saying, you and 10 other people are being considered for this role. I thought, great. If I get this far in the process, I'll be happy. Then two days go by, and then they say, it's you and three other people. Oh, and by the way, this is going to be for Star Trek. <laughs> you can imagine my shock. And then I spoke to producers and the director of the first two episodes, Hanali Culpepper, and I had a throat infection, a chest infection, all of these bad things. <clears throat> kind of like I do now, um, and then I'm just trying to remember the story here because I was shooting, it was like 6 a.m. in the morning we wrapped, and I've been shooting since 6 a.m. the day previously. So I'm hopping into bed, and I get a call from my manager saying, you've got the role, and the only thing I remember saying was, okay, cool. I hung up my phone, I went back to bed, and then I woke up, I think like four hours later being like, was that a dream? Did I just imagine this? So I had to ring back home. I'm like, did this actually happen? And he's like, no, yes, you've got the role. They're sending you, you know, all of this stuff to sign, NDAs. You can't tell anyone. So please, for the love of God, do not. So I immediately called my mum and my dad and I'm like, I'm gonna be on Star Trek. And that's pretty much how it happened. And then I ended up flying to um, LA in like four, like four weeks later. And, and now you're on the Star Trek cruise. And now I'm on the Star Trek cruise. Uh, Issa, were there any fever dreams involved in your process like that? Or? Um, well, at the time, um, I was doing the first national tour of Hamilton. I <laughs> Um, yeah, I was somewhere, I think I was in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, performing Hamilton. Hey, we got some, some big land from uh, Cincinnati. Um, but yeah, I was there, and I, I had been like self-taping off and on, you know, doing eight shows a week, and then on top of that, trying to self-tape as much as possible, but um, then this, this new thing came through, and it was like, yeah, Patrick Stewart is the lead, and he's also the executive producer, and he's the blah, blah, blah. This sounds stinky. <laughs> like, I don't know what's going on here. Um, yeah, and then I just started self-taping, and it was for a character named Indira. Um, and which, now that I, now that uh, Discovery is out, I was like, that sounds a lot like Adira that blew Del Mario plays. And I was like, they just didn't do much stretch in there. <laughs> you know, it's funny, so the, you said Indira. What were the two names they gave you? K-Bar, and then Patrick in the scene was O'Toole. O'Toole, yeah. So, so these are names that are like Star Trek adjacent. Like, they're, yeah. they're names for Earth, but they could also be named for Star Trek. These yeah. producers are very clever. Oh, yeah. They know what they're they, doing. They know how to drop in little hints, right. especially if there's like a Trekkie really like auditioning. They, they probably read it and they're like, oh, I know exactly what this is. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I interrupted you. No, 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 but yeah, and uh, I sent it through, and I think 
in the beginning part of this process, they weren't quite sure the direction they wanted to go with Soji. I think they were still trying to figure out what kind of synthetic she was. Um, they weren't sure if she was going to be a lot like Data or completely different, just like how human presenting she was. So they kept sending me notes for each self tape being like, okay, uh, no, you should do it like really like robotic, like no, no emotion, no emotion at all. And then I send in that tape and then I get another one. They're like, put some feeling into it. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I'll do that next. Um, and that was about like six self tapes of, of Hanalei, our first director, calling me, giving me more <laughs> conflicting notes, and then me sending in another tape. And um, yeah, and by that time, I was reaching the end of my uh, contract with Hamilton. And I was about to do my last show, and I found out that uh, my agents called me and said, Patrick Stewart loved your tape and wants to meet with you. <laughs> I was like, um, okay, I have to go on stage. Let me freak about this later. Because <laughs> um, I was literally backstage about to go perform Say No to This. <laughs> and I just got that call. I was like, Ooh. And um, yeah, so I left my, my last day at, with Hamilton, flew to LA, and that's where my family is, so I got to stay with them do my final callbacks, I walk into the room and, and I knew I was gonna meet Patrick Stewart. But you know how you like think you know what it's gonna be like and then it's not, you don't, you, you don't know that shit. And so I walk into the room and I knew he was gonna be there but I was like, you look like Patrick Stewart. <laughs> Cause I was just like, you don't expect them, like you don't expect legends like that to look how you see them on TV. And I was like, it's you, man. <laughs> And yeah, and then we, we did the audition. He was so wonderful. He was so, he had all of his lines memorized and just did the whole thing with me. It was like kind of the first meeting, basically. They changed it a little bit, but did that. And then uh, I found out two days later and I was sitting on the couch with my family because I just happened to be in LA then. And it was a really special moment because I was just sitting there having coffee with them and we just started freaking out and like, calling everyone we knew, of course, even though in NDA, whoops, sorry. <laughs> whoops. <laughs> you can't expect us to keep stuff like that in. I mean, that's just too much. <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was the process. That is awesome. That's really fun. Um, and it, it sort of anticipated a follow-up question that I had specifically for you. There is on the show a tremendous um, care between your character and Picard. I mean, there's a there's a, a familiar, like a grandfatherly uh, relationship there. I know you're both professional actors, so I understand that it is on a very real level make believe. But I do get a sense that you know there is a, a true relationship there. So what I want to know is, did you ever, did did Sir Patrick ever like? take you out for tea or something, when there was nobody else around, it wasn't only about work, it was just a schmooze, did you ever get any of that? Um, well I don't want to out him for not being like chivalrous, like, <laughs> no, but he, we of course didn't have time for that kind of stuff, because as soon as I booked it, it was like, okay, you have like, here's the script, we see you in a week, and everyone's flying in, and it was just kind of Show chaos. Business. Show business, baby! Right. But, um, but yeah, I, what I do remember is that, um, unfortunately with film and TV, and this is hard coming from theater, you don't get a lot of rehearsal process, if any. And we thankfully had a couple weeks where we got to prepare and work together, do some table work, just like one-on-one -on -one with the director and with our fellow actors, um, which was wonderful. And so a lot of that character building was between Patrick and me. And uh, we just got to sit at a table and just run these scenes and discuss our relationship and, and, and the feelings there. And uh, that was just, as an actor, that makes you giddy, the fact that you get this kind of, whoa, what was that? <laughs> that was a lot. Um, but yeah. <laughs> the iceberg. We hit an iceberg. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was, that was really, um, really special. And I think what helped uh, create that bond that then translated on screen. But that, that first scene where I meet Picard, that was the first scene I ever did. That was my first day of work. And it was the scariest moment of my life where I'm just like, I show up 
in 100 degree heat in Sonoma County, <laughs> Los Angeles, uh, California, and uh, I'm just wearing a giant wool coat <laughs> with blood being painted all over my face, and I'm just screaming at Sir Patrick Stewart. Um, and I was like, I guess this is my job now. <laughs> That's really cool. But he was so, so caring. Now just talking about Patrick, not just Jean-Luc Picard, but he was, he could tell how nervous I was, obviously. And, and, um, and I was so nervous that I didn't want to ruin the takes. I didn't want to ruin it. And, and also coming from theater, this felt so different and so new. And there's a camera right in your face. And I just it didn't want to mess up. And at one point, he just took my hand. And when I was like shaking and just didn't know what to do, he just grabbed my hand. We had to like wait for a, an airplane to pass because we, we finally were getting a good take and then we had to hold for an airplane and I was like shaking trying to keep it all together and he just grabbed my hand and just said like I'm here with you and just kept kept breathing with me until we could continue the scene and that was a moment when I was like oh this is this is special this is a good family to be a part of awesome that's really cool um, uh, you, you mentioned preparation. Evan, your, your character is a member of the, and I want to pronounce this correctly, the Coat Milat. Well pronounced. Which is, of course, a Romulan band of uh, ninja warriors. <laughs> so, uh, assuming that you're not an actual Romulan ninja warrior, there had to have been some sort of weapons training preparation. Um, do this and do it right, choreography. Can you tell us a little bit about what that process is like? The day I touched down in LA, I was jet lagged, I was so tired, I made my way out to, am I allowed to say where we filmed? National Waters, All right? Yeah, I, I made my way to Santa Clarita and then I met Patrick, terrible encounter, terrible first meeting. He said hi. Yeah, say what, say what he said. <sighs> I was, it's, he was doing the interview scene and then they called cut, the producers and the director go over to him and they point him towards me and I'm there, I'm shaking, I'm sweating, swearing, like fuck, fuck, fuck. <laughs> he goes, hi, I'm Patrick, I reach out my hand and I say, good thank you. <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> So after that, I go to the stunt area, which is just a set that's not being used. I meet my stunt double at the time, Anise, and he hands me this like cool plastic sword. And I go, what is this? And he goes, this is going to be your best friend for the rest of the season. <laughs> and then from then on, it was like three, four hours a day. They were teaching me how to hold a sword, swing a sword, stab, all that, parry, everything. But it was like really intensive, no, intense. Not Imagine having stabbing classes. <laughs> it's an art form, it really is. I can sew now too. <laughs> but yeah, it was just, it was really just learning the stances and then the positions and then it's almost like dance choreography after that. So they knew I wasn't an expert swordsman or anything like that. So they gave me five or six moves to kind of learn and then from there we would do the drill, which is the fight broken up in certain sequences. We do, let's say there's three, three sequences. We do the first one until I got it right, the second, and then the third, and then we just combine it all together. And it all depends on how they want to film the fight sequence as well. Sometimes they want to do it as a one, which means all the way through, and that's it, or otherwise they want to change the angles a bit. So it'll be the first sequence of the fight, we're doing it up close. So you don't have to move that much. And then the second sequence will be wide, and then et cetera, et cetera. But it was, it was very fun, it was sweaty work, similar to you know how much I was sweating the other night while I was DJing. Um, but yeah, it was so much fun, and you know it's a credit to the stunties because that's stunt people, for people who don't know. It's a credit to their work to make me look good. Well, I mean, it looks pretty badass on screen, so I'm, uh, yeah, pretty good. I, I don't want you there defending me if uh, I'm never being chased by Baddies. Um, John, uh, you obviously you um, last portrayed Q a very long time ago, and you've been, you know, very involved in the Star Trek world since then. You've been coming to events like this. There have been various sort of like one-off things, maybe voiceover work or whatever. But to get back into Q 
for the first time in decades, that first day when the director calls action, what were you, what, what were you thinking? I play a jerk, so it was really easy. <laughs> it's like rolling off a log. Right? <laughs> thinking. I was thinking, as I said to Patrick, um, isn't this amazing? 34 years ago we were, we were nose to nose and here we are again. So that's what I was thinking. Um, you know, Q is, I mean, you, the fans love Q. I mean, you were originally never you were supposed to be in one episode, and the next thing you know, you're back, and you're back again, and you're back again, and you're on Voyager, and everybody loves you, so you got to hang out with Vosh, which is, I want to hang out with Vosh, so that's pretty cool. Um, so clearly you've been with this character for a very long time, so I have a question for, for you about Q. Um, Q loves Jean-Luc, he loves to torment him, he's like the kid who puts the frog down the shirt of the girl he's got a crush on. Jean-Luc Get off my bridge. Jean-Luc hates Q on the surface. Do you think deep down Jean-Luc kind of likes Q back a little bit? If he just changed his behavior, they could be friends maybe? I don't know about being friends. <laughs> um, uh, but in reality, uh, it, and it's, it's not too much of a, of a turn. Um, uh, certainly in what you will be seeing coming up. There's a, um, there is a, a, a love involvement. And I don't mean a, you know, physical love involvement. I mean that um, this character, Q, loves Picard. And what we discover is, in this case, there are elements that have to do with, um, there's a, an urgency to what he would like Picard to do needs to do and it comes out of you know it might be tough love but um i love you yeah cool. well i'm intending to watch i did not watch the premiere last night oh. uh, hands up here you did hands up here hey. i want to watch it in the comfort of my own home so i can hit pause and go back and study and take notes and blog and tweets, so that's why I didn't do it uh, here with it in person. But um, qu qu question for, for the whole gang here. Um, we who are involved and come to conventions and the Star Trek crews uh, have over the years been delighted to see our friends Patrick Stewart and Brent Spiner. I think the phrase is take the piss out of on each other. They, they really do like to trade zings. And I know, as you said, it's show business, it's all business, money is. You know, the clock is ticking, money's on the line, but when Brent Spider and Patrick Stewart are together, there's gotta be some sparks. So I'm wondering if you've been witness to any hilarity while shooting Picard. I think any time any of, any of the cast of The Next Generation comes together, it's like you're watching just two old friends sitting, or, sitting in a living room just like trading stories. Like it immediately becomes that we are just like peering in on a wonderful intimate reunion. Um, and yeah, I think with, uh, with Brent, Jonathan Frakes as well, when, once you see the three of them together. They take the piss out of each other a lot. Like, it's, it's funny to watch. It's, it's funny because we obviously coming in later as like the younger kind of like, whoa, Patrick Stewart, oh my God. And we're like so, so kind of like careful because we just want to be like, oh, like what's gonna happen? He's like so legendary, and then they walk in and they're like, hey, old baldy, old bitch. <laughs> God. So it's just so funny to see a whole other side of Sir Patrick Stewart through the eyes of his best friends. Yeah, you were saying that when um, you said Frakes, Frakes obviously is one of the directors. But he directed my first episode, yeah. I but love he, that name. He's also, he used to tell me that sometimes he'll pop by the set even when it's not his day. 
Yeah, they would. I mean, even, I think it was season, well, it has to be season one. <laughs> they all came and visited, uh, you once said, when Marina and... Um, yeah, when we were filming Nepenthe. Um, a wonderful episode. That was <laughs> one of the most exciting episodes to film, um, getting to work with Marina and Jonathan. And uh, yeah, we were all filming on the Universal lot and we were just uh, kind of sitting around waiting to do our scenes and all of a sudden LeVar Burton walks on and then all of a sudden Michael Dorn comes in and I was just like, oh my god. I, and I didn't realize how big of a fan I was until I was surrounded by them and then I was like, I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> so, it was so nerve wracking but so cool because I, I like came back from lunch with my with my tray, it felt like high school where I was just like walking in and I was like, oh, I'm gonna go over here, and they were all cool yeah, and they were all in a circle with their um, with their chairs, and they just waved me over. They're like, Isa, come eat with us, and I sat down with them, and they were just reminiscing about TNG days and taking the piss out of each other, and and since I was the only one who didn't know these stories, they were all just directing everything to me. <laughs> all telling me these things and I'm just sitting there like watching all of them and I was just like man people would pay billions of dollars to see what I am seeing right now and I get to do it on the job that's amazing. I remember LeVar came on set one day and I think it was a PA or an AD like we just got as soon as he walked through she was like <gasps> <laughs> And then they started singing the uh, theme song to Reading Rainbow together. It was really cool. <laughs> That's really cool. Well, you know, you say, you say that you didn't realize you were such a fan. You know, if you book now for Star Trek The Cruise 6, you get a few dollars off. So. Hey! Who signed up for next year's cruise? Um, uh, speaking of Jonathan Frakes, I mean, he is um, one of the directors. You said he'd he shot your first... Um, First two episodes, First. so where Seven comes in, and then the next episode with Bejazel. Bejazel? Bejazel? Bejazel. Bejazel? Bejazel sounds... To... Oh, like a derogatory term. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm curious, I mean, all the directors are marvelous, but you know, John, we all love Jonathan Frakes a little bit more, just because we can recognize that guy. Um, what's a little bit of his special sauce? What makes a Frakes episode different? And and. He's Jonathan. loud. He's very loud. So loud. Action. <laughs> one of the one of the scenes that I did, um, I think it was uh, the moment when uh, Narek and Soji are, are sliding uh, with their socks like across the thing, uh, which was such a fun uh, scene to shoot, especially with Jonathan, because he's just like shouting things at us like, "Now do this! You're a bird! You're on this!" <laughs> and, <laughs> We ended one of the scenes and we were trying to tweak it like for perfect, um, just so the camera angles were right and everything and it was hard to get. And when we finally got it right, it's complete silence. We're just there, we end the scene and we just hear off in the distance, brilliant! <laughs> and that's Jonathan. <laughs> he's been doing it for so long as well. I mean, he was in TNG, he's directed so many of episodes across different series. He just knows it inside and out, and whenever he gets on set, even though he's so casual and laid back, there's this like level of professionalism there that you don't necessarily see with people who come on to direct who don't know the series and don't know the show. So that's probably why. If you ask, I feel like if you ask most actors and ask them like what their favorite kind of director is, usually they're gonna say an actor or director, like a director who also acts because yeah, you just, they, they know exactly how it works and especially when they know exactly how Star Trek works, like Evan was saying, he just knows, he knows what we're going through. He knows he's been in our shoes and knows how to handle each intimate and, and vulnerable situation um, with so much care, so much empathy and so much encouragement because he knows what it's like to be an actor and put yourself out there and be like, do people like me? I don't know. And he's there to be like, we love you. Let's keep going. Especially a director who will bellow brilliant when you're done with your take. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking specifically, John, because uh, Frank's directed a lot of episodes over the years. Was was he ever director on one of the episodes you worked on? Yeah, and I, I agree totally with what you guys are saying. I mean, um, Jonathan makes everything better. 
And, um, and you know you kind of have your back covered, especially for somebody like me where I kind of go, was that a little too big? <laughs> and you know, I'll get, mm. <laughs> so, um, uh, so it, yeah, he, he's it, it's it, it's great. It's 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 really it's really nice to, to work. There aren't enough good things that we can say about Jonathan. Awesome. Well, he's he is. Um, hey, shit, you know what? I'm gonna take a little indulgence. I'm gonna tell my Jonathan Frakes story. One of you, one of the fans, went into my room. I gave some woman the code of the safe and brought me my wallet and my passport. I watched her come down the stairs and hand it to me and I was able to get back home. And it was Riker's idea to have me do that. So God bless Jonathan Briggs. What decisions have you made so far, including from the premiere of last night, the decisions you have made in uh, making, uh, creating your character, Elmo, to portray how you think he should be portrayed? That's a really good question. Since the premiere last night, nothing, because everything's already been filmed. <laughs> but, I mean, once we get given the script, everyone as an actor has to make choices with what you do, how you say the lines, how you, your delivery, your interaction with other characters. And really, it was just my choices. I, I found when I read about Elnor, because I, sorry, K-Bar. <laughs> when I first read about him, he was described as this person who only grew up surrounded by women. I am the youngest of seven kids, and I have five sisters. So I grew up in a household surrounded by women. They also said that he is a refugee living in a planet that is not his home. I am the son of immigrants, and I grew up in Australia, and I've never really been back to where my father is from. I've had the pleasure of going back to the Pacific Islands where my mother is from, and like learning about my heritage. So I just found so many connections between me and this character, a lot of like parallels, and like even going to Los Angeles, uh, a city I didn't know, um, it was the first time I'd ever been to America, I felt like a fish out of water. So I could kind of draw from those experiences and those connections that I had and like utilize them and use them in my performances, Elnor. Very cool. Um, so I was just thinking, first off, thank you all for the <laughs> hard work you did in filming this season, bringing it to us, especially during the peak of COVID, and I'm sure it wasn't easy. And so I was curious for you, and I'm sure filming this season must have brought a lot of new challenges and changes and differences. And so whether, um, Evan and Easy, you know, whether you're kind of just starting on the Star Trek journey or whether this is a new chapter in a 30 plus year journey, just what was different about filming this last season that kind of was the biggest takeaway and what you really like learned from it and how, how you had to approach it differently? Well, if, talking about COVID specifically, how that changed filming, um, that was definitely, that was hard because uh, our cast, thankfully, is really close and we are a very tight-knit group. So all of a sudden coming back to work and we can't even hug each other was really hard, as I'm sure we all know just in life. But we haven't been able to see our loved ones uh, like we would like to. So uh, yeah, coming back to work and having like a shield, a, a face shield and masks between us, wanting to just hug each other and cry and uh, do all of that that we wanted to do for two years, um, that was a kind of heartbreaking not not being able to do that. But I think at a certain point, I know that you, I was like, oh, I don't think we're allowed to touch each other, and I saw you and you just came over and gave me a giant hug and like spun yeah, me around everyone. and I was like, all right, I, yeah, this is my I, guy, this is my guy. <laughs> Actually, can I share a little secret with you all? Don't tell anyone. Oh. <laughs> so, when we were, the, film, the scene that we saw last night of my character with Patrick, the day after that, I went in to film again, and we do these rapid COVID tests. And for those who don't know, you get tested, and 20 minutes later, it tells you whether you're positive or negative. The thing about them is they're not entirely accurate. So I rocked up to work at four in the morning, got my breakfast, I got tested, and they said, 
you'll be ready for hair and makeup in 30 minutes. I thought, great, I can have a little nap. I woke up, an hour and 40 minutes had passed by, and I was like, something is wrong. And then I get a knock at the door, and they say, you tested positive for COVID. And we're at SoFi Stadium, where the um, Super Bowl was just being filmed. It's a big set. And I shut down set for two weeks because of a false positive. Yeah. And then they asked me, did you touch anyone or come into contact with anyone? And I was like, everyone? I, I hugged everyone. And I was like, no, 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 no. no. The last minute shutdowns were really, were hard because then it would also like break up the momentum of filming and also for just the logistical side, having to not use the SoFi Stadium after they booked it out for that amount of time was really hard. But uh, but we made it through, I mean, it happened. We, that was what was so amazing about seeing it. It was like, oh my God, we did that. It finally worked. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I mean, I was told that we were gonna start on whatever month it was. And then that kept on getting moved and moved and moved. And of course, with that moves everything else. And going on the set for the first time, I mean, people really were taking this seriously. We all at home were taking it seriously. But when you walked on stage, it almost had the feeling of walking into a surgical, um, you know, op operating thing. Everybody was masked. You, you were, you did not touch certain things and what have you. And we had like plexiglass separators between us at our chairs, even though we had just done a scene where we're like right up in each other's faces and now we're like, can't touch, I guess. Right, and I, the first scene which I shot, which was, no, oh, you haven't seen it yet. Uh, <laughs> which will be next week. Um, um, I uh, got a call maybe two days later saying, you, um, one of the makeup artists, and you know well enough not to ask. Yeah. You know well enough not to ask because there's, you, you don't want to get into, well, oh, really, well, uh, um, one of the makeup artists tested positive and we're going to be shutting down. Uh, one of your makeup artists tested positive and we're going to be shutting down for uh, a couple of weeks. Um, and then we had to shut down again with, uh, for another issue. And uh, all I can tell you is, is that I'm glad I wasn't bankrolling this uh, show <laughs> because the cost, the cost overruns to be able to um, continue to produce another, we get another iceberg. <laughs> the cost overruns to uh, produce this show are extraordinary, extraordinary. I love the fact that we have the experience and the new here for this unconventional voyage. So I was curious, John, if you can kind of go back in time and think about your first experience in at your first first convention and what was going through your mind, if you have any anecdotes. And then for you two, if you've ever been to a convention prior to this and how it is being on the other side and also as actors now coming into this convention scene and you know, what was going through your mind on your first one? Well, um, I was interested in your audition process. I mean, you know I just slept with Gene Roddenberry, so that's how I did it. Um, old joke. Um, uh, but while you were talking, it, uh, something did come to mind. Uh, again, uh, you will have this experience as, an, as a venerable old actor in all of this. You will have this experience. This is an audience that has been told everything and remembers everything. <laughs> so they will know this story. But I was a couple of days into shooting uh, Encounter at Farpoint. Uh, like you, I had just come from a play and blah, 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 and stuff like that. And I'm just watching a setup. And um, a voice behind me says, you have no idea what you've gotten yourself into. And I turned around and it was Gene Roddenberry. And I said, Gene, what are you talking about? He said, oh, you will find out. <laughs> well, I now offer that to you. <laughs> you have no idea what you've gotten yourself into. first convention was actually in Florida. It's funny how we always remember the first of everything, don't we? Um, my first convention was in Florida, 
And I arrived and they said, well, you're going to be thrown out on stage. And, you know, it was a big audience and what have you. But mostly what I was struck with is that it was sometime in August and everybody looked like it was a Halloween costume. <laughs> it, was, it was Halloween. I was going, what is going on? Everybody's dressed up. I have no idea. Yes, it was, that was a, um, a baptism by fire and I've been doing it ever since and I think you will too. Yeah, I think for us, when we, before we, yeah, before we did like more um, uh, kind of getting to actually interact with people and do like signings and autographs, we did a San Diego Comic Con where we didn't really get to meet anyone yet, but it was just the big panel kind of introducing Picard for the first time. And uh, that was just crazy because we, we were still in the middle of filming. I think we, you had just come from a crazy late shoot. You, yeah, you came yeah. in like... They drove me in at like three in the morning when I left Santa Clarita Studios and I was asleep the entire time. <laughs> yeah. And um, so we, we were still just like deep in the filming process, not even really thinking about, or at least I wasn't really thinking about like what it's gonna be like when it comes out. And all of a sudden, it hit me. I was like, "Oh my God! Thousands see of people faces are about come out. yeah, thousands of people are about to see us right now for the first time because no one had really seen our trailer yet. No one really knew who we were, and we walked out onto that stage. And even though they introduced us um, individually, obviously Patrick gets an amazing reception. And I was like, "Oh, they don't know us. Like, what are they gonna do for us?" And we walked out and just so much clapping, so much cheering, just so much pure love coming at us, and, you, and no one even knew who we were, but it was, we were already inducted into the family, so it, it, it was just welcome arms, and that, that was so beautiful. Welcome to the Trek family, it was great. And then our first actual convention was during the last cruise, I mean, we weren't on it, on it obviously, but we were in Chicago, and... Like, four days before the world shut down. Yeah, it was crazy. And I think my episode had just, my first episode had just aired the night before. And, um, you know, I could drink there too, but it's not as good as drinking here. <laughs> and uh, there were a lot more of you here than there were there. Um, but it was, it was a blast. I mean, it's been nothing but love since day one. And, you know, thank you for welcoming us to the family. Awesome. Thank you. Very cool. What's your favorite episode you've done so far? And what is your least favorite? What was the hardest? Oh, episode? we're going there now. <laughs> my favorite episode, I'd have to say, was my introductory introduction episode, Absolute Candor, only because I get to slice someone's head off and it's shown in the episode. I loved it. It was and I have a badass line, please my friend choose to live. <laughs> Favorite? He loves them all. <laughs> I love them all. Anyone that I'm not in, how about that? Yeah, that? There you go. Um, I think probably Nepenthe was my favorite. To play. Yeah, that was incredible. Just getting to hang out with everyone and, and see what I, I remember that day so clearly because we filmed one part of it very briefly. Um, I think it was just me like walking up and it's a very easy scene to film because it's kind of just us like looking at each other <laughs> and then then um, we start to set up the next scene which I wasn't in and so they're like you can go back to your trailer and whatever we're gonna rehearse their scene and I was like oh no I'm fucking staying for this <laughs> and I was just sitting kind of off to the side watching them uh, block and just kind of run organically at the scene where um, uh, Picard sees uh, Riker for the first time uh, and I was just sitting there watching it and we the whole room we were all sobbing as he did when Jonathan just opens his arms and puts him in that bear hug it was just like it took everyone's breath away and I was like it was just one of those moments where I was like I can't believe I'm here I cannot believe I get to do this um, so I think that was probably my favorite episode and also getting to hang out with LeVar and Michael um, all of them cursing at me and taking the piss out of each other. Um, and I have no least favorite because of that. What a, what a bitch I would be if I said anything about that. 
John Delancey, this is a good question. What is your favorite episode? Uh, well, I'm trying to, uh, without going back over the old stuff, I'm trying to think of the new stuff. I, I, I am a catalyst in this show, okay? Um, which means that I come in occasionally. And um, there are, uh, I, I come in six times, I think. And out of that, I would say that there are two or three that are really important scenes. Um, one is with Brent. Um, um, are we allowed to be saying this? What's that? Are we allowed to be saying this? The DJ, whatever. It's shown in the trailer. Okay. It's shown in the trailer. It's in the trailer. It's in the trailer. It's, in the trailer. it's cute. It's John. Um, uh, some scenes that are going to be coming up next. And then some, uh, at, the, at the end, some, uh, some scenes with Patrick, which are, which I, are, 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 mem are memorable, are memorable to both of us. They're, they're meaningful to both of us. Awesome. So you, have, you have something to look forward to. Awesome. Along with everything else. What's the one where you lose your power and Corbin Burnson shows up? What's that one? Is that the best one? Or is it all good things? Is that all the good one? things, I think. Oh, uh, right. And also, Tapestry was very good. Oh my god. I, I'm going to make a statement here on International Waters. Any Q is good Q, and when Q is a, when it's a Q episode, strap in, because it's getting good. We have a question on this side. Mr. Delancey, um, I'm really curious when they approached you for Picard. Was it like, what? Or was it like, I mean, obviously they probably offered you a, a good deal to do this, but, um, <laughs> but was, it, was it a hard... But was it a hard decision to reprise the role? I mean, was it like instantly, of course, or was it like something that you had to even think about or talk to your agent, or how did it go for you? My last show was All, all Good Things. Uh, that was back in the Pleistocene. And, um, and um, you know, one of the things as an actor is that, and, and, and then they did, you know, whatever, three or four movies. Uh, I, one of the things you have to kind of discipline yourself is to not hope that you're going to be invited to somebody's dinner party. You have nothing to do with it. You, you, you can't control it. So as time went on, I went, you know what, that's, that's the end. I, every time I played the character, I figured that was the end. I'm never gonna do another one. And then, so all told in the Star Trek pantheon, I did nine episodes. Uh, in, on three shows, never to be done again. So when I did get a call, when my agent called, and I, they said um, they would like to talk to you about Star Trek, would you meet with them in, at Paramount? That was uh, a meeting that was, again, because of COVID, um, extended, extended, extended. And finally, I did meet with Terry, I think it was. And the first thing I said to Terry, he said, I guess you expected to be called. I said, well, actually, I didn't. And, I, and then we started talking, and I said, you know, I have one precondition. And uh, if we get past that, we can really have this conversation. He said, oh my God, what is it? I said, you're not gonna put, put me back in those tights again. <laughs> because it would be really unseemly. <laughs> and he said, no, oh, no, 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 no. And then he discussed what it was that they had in mind and what have you, and I went, oh great, the other, and, and on a serious note, the other thing was, uh, for an actor, and I dare say for all of us in life, um, you can really never go back. So the notion that we were going to try to recreate um, the elements of a character that had been played 20 years before was really kind of concerning to me. Um, <laughs> and, and um, yeah. Yeah. We just, we're just going through an ice field right now. I don't, like it. don't worry about it. <laughs> but you do know that song, Nearer to God. Ne nearer. <laughs> uh, okay, good. Um, okay, so, so that was the, uh, that was the, the important part of all this to me. We're not going to try to read, I'm not going to be bouncing around kind of like this and, you know, like all that type of stuff. He said, no. I said, great, uh, great. And so they explained to me the story, although they didn't have the whole story mapped out, but at least where it was going to go. And I went, great, I'm, I'm on board. I love it. It's exciting.
exciting. It's an exciting time. It really is. It's a golden age of Star Trek. And you know what? We do have time for one more question. We're going to make it quick, so make it good. I think part of the wonderful thing about Star Trek is we can see ourselves in folks who are represented on screen, and I'm Filipino, and from my understanding, you said you are a highly yeah. Filipino descent, and you have a lot of pride for folks who seem folks on, on screen, and I'm wondering, what does it mean to you to have, be part of the Star Trek representation in that way for Filipino folks? Well, hey there, Kuya. <laughs> What's up? Um, yeah, I think uh, that that's a very important question. Um, I remember, so I'm, I'm Hapa, I'm a Filipino and Swedish and Irish, and um, growing up acting, so I've been acting since I was like nine, and um, when you're a kid uh, trying to act, a lot of the time uh, when they're casting, they're trying to fit you into a family, because um, usually it's like the, the leads are the parents, and then you have to like fit in and look like the parents. And at that time, obviously, I am young and, and things were already progressing, but uh, it, it, seeing interracial couples was still not super out there yet, especially not like the mix that I have where it was a Filipino dad and a white mom. Um, but usually I was going out for either the blonde, blue-eyed family or the uh, fully Chinese family, and I didn't fit into either of those. And so that made, I think anyone knows that like racial identity can be a very hard thing to, to grapple with, especially growing up and can do some, do a number to your uh, mental health and feeling just not enough because people are often telling you you're not white enough, you're not Asian enough, you're not this enough, you're not that enough. And, um, and that can really kind of damage your confidence and suddenly I started to grow out of that um, childhood phase where suddenly it didn't, they weren't trying to fit me into a box and they were just looking for someone. And with this show, getting to audition and not having to fit into any box or look like anyone else was so freeing. And when I was cast, I was like, I wonder, I mean, I know that I'm Data's daughter, but there are supposed to be parents that they show. And I was like, I wonder, they're probably gonna cast like a white family because that's usually how it goes with me. But then they were like, well, you're Filipino. We're gonna cast a Filipino woman as your mother. And I was like, oh my God, for the first time, like, it didn't matter what I was. It just like, once they, once they found the person they wanted, that's when they added everything else. It wasn't trying to squeeze me into a box that I didn't quite fit in. And, um, and that was just one of those moments where I was like, I really hope this continues. I want this to continue for, Everyone, especially, I mean, you know, I've, I've got a, quite a good amount of white privilege here, but, you know, I just, I hope it continues for other people, people who are less represented, people who are darker skinned and, and uh, ostracized because of it. I just hope that we continue to get rid of these barriers that it's always trying to fit you into a box and, and, and make you get in line when we don't really, that's not how we are as humans. We are so, <laughs> it's just there's we are so diverse just as human beings and um, and that's what I love about Star Trek is that it wasn't about it wasn't about my race it wasn't about who whatever box I fit in it was about the character and that they just wanted to tell a story. Well, I mean Star Trek has always been on the forefront of this fight and uh, we're not there yet but it's a lot of progress. Um, this has been a really tremendous panel, and I'm so excited to get, I mean, I, the only thing that's going to get me off this boat is to get home, to turn on Paramount Plus and watch new episodes of Discovery, new episodes of Picard. So thank you to our three guests, Evan, Lisa, and John, and thank you to all of you for your great questions. We still have another full day here at sea, so uh, have fun.